Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Recovering After Bushfires, What Role Can Landcare Play? Uh, my name is Rowan Ewing. I'm the Head of Landcare Services at Landcare Australia. And um, welcome. Let's uh, step into it. To kick off proceedings, I know this webinar is being joined by people from right across Australia. I'd like to start by <clears throat> thanking any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are attending today and recognise the fact that they're the original land carers who continue to care for their country for millennia, which is the land on which we now all sit. I'm presenting from Bulaka Beck, which is the Woiwurrung name for the Brunswick area of Melbourne, and I'd like to specifically acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of this land and respectfully acknowledge their elders past, present and upcoming. And for today's webinar, uh, we've got Chris Coburn, who will be presenting on the Land Care Fire Recovery Project. Chris is from the Upper Goulburn Land Care Network in Victoria, who was severely impacted by the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires. You'll all have the opportunity to ask questions after his presentation, and you can do that by um, typing it into the box below the webinar screen, and we'll collate those as we go along. And, um, put those questions to him at the end. You just need to make sure that you're logged into Landcarer and that the webinar isn't in full screen mode if you want to use that um, chat comment feature. If you have any issues, please click, click the green live support button on the bottom left of your screen and one of the support team will help you. If you've got any, uh, uh, after Chris's presentation, I'll then have a chat about um, Landcare Australia's bushfire recovery efforts. And, um, we also have a new bushfire recovery online community on the Land Carer, which is a place where anyone involved in bushfire recovery activities can join up, share knowledge, troubleshoot issues, and connect with others. You can uh, check it out on the last slide for a link. So I might hand over to Chris now. Thanks, Rowan. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Black Saturday fires that occurred in 2009, and these fires covered 450,000 hectares, and much of it was in our region, the Upper Goulburn region, and affected quite a few of our land care groups in our area and also neighbouring areas. The Upper Goulburn Land Care Network was quick to react after the fires, and one of the first things that our executive committee and coordinators at the time did was to send out an expression of interest form to get some feedback from fire affected landowners about what land management issues they were having concerns with and needed help with their recovery. Um, and this included many things like fencing, revegetation, pest plants, pest animal control, uh, erosion, those sort of issues. And we used this form to work out what sort of projects that our network thought we could run to help landowners uh, with their fire recovery on their properties. And the form was sent out to land care groups, but not just land care members, we sent it out to the wider community as well through the fire recovery hubs and uh, through Murrindindi Shire. And we use these forms when we receive them back to, like I said, to work out what sort of projects and what were the priorities of, of landowners in our region that have been fire affected. Um, one of the other first things that our network did was to source funding to employ myself as fire recovery coordinator, uh, but also to fund our different projects that we wanted to run. And a major uh, source of funding was through the federal government and their Caring for Our Country program. And our fire recovery program ran for a number of years. And we were able, during that time, we were able to apply for funding from many sources. Another major one was the Victorian State Government through their uh, Recycling for Recovery program. 
but we had many other smaller grants too over the life of the project from the Murray Indian Shire Council, Landcare Australia, FRRR also provided a reasonable amount of funding a few years down the track when um, our projects did run for about four or five years in total, many of them. And also the Goulburn Broken and the Port Phillip CMAs, Catchment Management Authorities, also assisted us, um, especially the Golden Broken, because much of our area is in the Golden Broken catchment. But parts of the King Lake Ranges were also fell off into the Port Phillip Catchment Authority. So they provided funding to assist landowners in the King Lake Ranges that were in their catchment. And during that time, other corporate funding became available too. And we applied for a couple of other grants through the National Bank and CSL. Now, the very first project that our network ran was a fencing project called Fences Without Boundaries. And early on, we had many offers of assistance that were coming to the Upper Goulburn and through Landcare uh, from volunteers, corporate volunteers, individuals and other organisations wanting to come out, come up and do what they can to help us with our uh, fire recovery. So one of the first and important jobs, a job that was needed by most fire affected landowners was removing burnt and damaged fences. And also during that time, we had the assistance from many people wanting to volunteer, but we also had good assistance from um, our neighbouring land care networks in the unburnt areas that were able to come down and work with us supervising volunteers and helping us to apply for funding um, and in many other ways as well. So that was very important, having that the land care community come on board with us as well and, and offer their assistance um, as well as all the other individuals and corporates from around, around the state and around the country. School groups came up as well as the corporates and we ran working bees with, with them on fire affected properties, pulling out the steel pickets, rolling up wires um, and cleaning up, preparing the fencing sites for the skilled volunteers that were going to follow through. And we were also getting offers from many skilled volunteers uh, to come and help rebuild fencing, volunteers that were skilled at actually building fences. And here's a photo here you can see a mixture of people, men and women, of course, from Rotary, Uniting Church, and individuals that came up and worked with us to rebuild fences. Um, on these fire affected properties. We also had volunteers from Conservation Volunteers Australia. Teams of those people came up and they were great. They had their own supervisor, they had equipment and they were very worthwhile removing fences and building fences. And four wheel drive clubs as well too. We had a couple of very good teams from four wheel drive clubs that were keen to come up on weekends and help. Um, but of course, like I said, Uniting Church and Rotary, they were our main two sources of the skilled volunteers. We also purchased our tractor, you can see in the photograph there, um, down the track when we got the state government funding. We were hiring that tractor to ram in steel pickets and clear fence lines, but we ended up buying it and we sold it at the end of the project, of course. And skilled volunteers also worked with us to supervise the corporate volunteers rebuilding fences. And there's a group from the National Bank here with one of our skilled fencing volunteers. And, um, and even though these people had never done fencing before, we provided the safety equipment for them, safety glasses, gloves, and vests. And there was many tasks that they were able to do, installing steel pickets and running wires and tying off. Um, and over the course of the project, we rebuilt 247 kilometres of fencing on fire affected properties. Uh, we provided the labour 
to rebuild the fences and remove the fences beforehand. But the landowners provided the food to feed the hungry workers and they also provided the fencing materials in most cases. Uh, during that time as well too, it was a priority because we were land care and so a priority for us was to protect native vegetation, waterways and those sort of areas on properties. So often through the assistance of the Golden Broken Catchment Authority, um, we were able to fence off 31 kilometres to protect waterways, remnant bushland and wetland areas, as you can see in this photo here. That was down near Glenburn. Um, so that area has been permanently protected from stock and naturally regenerating and become a conservation area on the property. Now, another main project, well, another main uh, issue the land owners had was revegetation. In the forested areas around King Lake, Marysville, of course, you know, they were regenerating quite well in many cases. But in the farming areas and the more open country and on farms that had had maybe um, shelter belts, windbreaks and wildlife corridors that had been planted, they'd been destroyed and the seed source hadn't been in the soil as in the forested areas, so it was slow to recover and in some cases needed planting to, to regenerate the areas. Um, so we set up a project called the Lorax Project and we purchased plants, tree guards, stakes, tools, Hamilton planters, hammers, those sort of things to help landowners with their revegetation using the many volunteers that we've been using during for our fencing program to help revegetate these fire affected properties. You can see a big group from National Bank here, or ANZ, um, on a farm in Strath Creek. And the main role of the landowners was to make ensure that the sites were free from stock, so fenced off, stock had no access, and any high threat woody weeds were controlled. We didn't want to be planting it amongst blackberries and gorse and those sort of things that would need weed control done down the track. So, um, and then we provided, once the site was ready, we provided volunteers and materials and plants to revegetate these areas. Wasn't always bushland and farms. Sometimes there was garden rehabilitation that was important to some landowners, like this property here in Taggarty at the foot of the Cathedral Ranges. Their garden was, was pretty much destroyed. And, and having volunteers come and us providing indigenous plants, of course, local to the area, to uh, revegetate their gardens was something that these landowners were you know, very keen on. <clears throat> Over the course of the, well, for the first three years, um, we had 2,347 volunteers plant over 44,000 plants. Uh, and the Lorax project is a project that we've still continued to this day. And we still get the volunteers wanting to come up. Of course, this year with the virus and, and the restrictions in place, we haven't been able to get our usual volunteers from Melbourne, from corporate groups such as NAB, ANZ and Telstra um, this year. But up until last year, every year we'd still be getting the volunteers coming up as part of our regular land care program for our area. Um, and it just didn't have to be in the fire affected areas to this day. They, they will come to any farm in our area as long as the sites are prepared and we can provide the assistance with supervising the, uh, the days. Another 
Pro another uh, part of the revegetation project was we produced a revegetation guide for landowners in the fire affected areas to provide them with advice and information about how to go about revegetating um, on their farms, properties, and whether they even needed revegetation. In some fire affected areas, they were re re uh, rehabilitating naturally themselves quite well. Um, and this re vegetation guide was funded through our state government recycling for recovery program and we printed hard copies of the book and it's also available online and in recent years other parts of the country such as Tasmania and this this year in East Gippsland we've been able to update the guide and adapt it to suit their areas and their situation. So it's a, been a handy book, not just for our area, but for other fire affected areas across the country. Um, with a little bit of updating and adapting it to suit the local area, it's a very handy guide. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, another big issue for landowners, the, the bush was naturally regenerating very well and um, in many cases, but pest plants, weeds were also regenerating and some weeds, like native plants, get encouraged by fire. So there was issues with on properties with blackberry, gorse, broom, those sort of woody weeds but many other different weeds also had appeared that landowners weren't used to seeing on their properties. So we decided to run farm chemical user courses for landowners across our the Upper Goulburn region. And we ran those over many parts of, of, the, of the Upper Goulburn, at Strath Creek, Flowerdale, King Lake, over towards Marysville and Taggarty. And these were very well attended. It wasn't just weeds that they learnt about, they also learnt about how to control pest animals with fox baiting and rabbit baiting. And they learnt safe use of chemicals, storage of chemicals, um, had record keeping, which is important too, and what sort of equipment is needed um, for controlling pest plants and animals. So they were very um, informative courses gave the participants a qualification towards their ACUP, Agricultural Chemical Users Permit, and um, then they were also able then to go out and purchase restricted chemicals um, for weed control or pest animal baiting. We also ran another um, educational uh, course for landowners. It was a Weed Identification and Control Workshop, not an official course like the Farm Chemical Users course, but still a handy half-day course that participants came along to. They often would bring weeds, samples of weeds that they had growing on their properties, um, and we were able to often, in most cases, identify what those weeds were and give them advice on the different type of equipment for controlling different types of weeds, depending on their situation. And, um, you know, there was all sorts of weeds that were coming into our area um, through stock feed as well, too. Many kind people across the country had donated stock feed um, from other parts of, of the country, of course. These were bringing, in some cases, new weeds that we didn't have in our area. So it was important that landowners kept an, an eye on where they fed out this stock feed and monitored the site to ensure that no new weeds um, appeared. And in some cases, there were new weeds. And one example, I went to a property in King Lake and mostly it was on farming properties, but this was a bushland property. They, their, their, um, property was managed for conservation for wildlife and they had a clearing in the middle of the bush that had Patterson's Curse and Applethorn which had come up 
and they had never seen those two weeds in on their property. And I thought, well, that's strange. Um, if they'd had, oh, I said to them, if you'd had stock feed maybe brought in, uh, I could understand, you know, these weeds appearing. But they said to me that they had stock feed because they'd got a couple of bales of hay to feed wallabies um, and other wildlife that were, because after the fires there wasn't a lot of feed around, of course, so they were um, giving free feed to the um, to the wildlife. So unwittingly, unknowingly, they brought in some weeds, but were able to, to identify these weeds and control them. And these weed ID workshops went a long way to helping landowners with those sort of issues. We also received funding from the state government to spray priority weeds, uh, blackberry, broom gorse, those sort of things, um, on private land in bushland areas or waterways that had conservation values. So the funding was used not just for spraying flat weeds in a, in a pasture situation, but it was for it was for spraying priority weeds in bushland areas so that there was a conservation outcome to it. A bit of a dry throat. Um, we also used volunteers from Conservation Volunteers Australia to work through these conservation areas on private land um, to cut out woody weeds using cut and paint method or hand weeding. And through that part of the, the project, we were able to control woody weeds over 300 hectares of bushland and waterways on fire affected properties. Now, another important issue that landowners felt strongly about was the wildlife and the recovery of the wildlife on their properties. Some people don't always have a, the same understanding of ecology as, as much of us in land care would. Um, and immediately after the fires, the country was devastated. And a lot of people thought the wildlife had been destroyed and is there much hope for it? Will it ever recover? Um, and of course, our wildlife and, and vegetation has adapted over, over millions of years to recover after fires. Um, although with the climate change, of course, you know, things could be different. Um, but still, there was, there was a need there and there was a want by volunteers and organisations to help the wildlife with its recovery. And nesting boxes were a good way of doing that. So we had scouts and school students building nesting boxes um, to be installed on properties that had been burnt out. Because in many cases, the bush was regenerating and the forest was, you know, coming back. But a lot of those big old trees that had hollows in them, natural hollows, uh, had the fire had gotten into those hollows, burnt them out, and the trees had been destroyed. So there was probably a, um, a lack of hollow natural hollows and homes for wildlife in these fire affected areas in some cases. So by us installing artificial homes, nesting boxes, we were providing alternative homes for these animals. And it was a great way for people to get involved as well too, building the boxes with the skilled students and then installing them um, on the properties with other volunteers and it's not just a matter of building a box and, and that's it. You need to be set up with equipment, ladders, GPS, um, and install the boxes. We keep records of where we install the boxes on a data sheet, which includes uh, the aspect of the box, the height of the box, the type of tree that the box is on, the type of box that the animal is providing, that the box is providing a uh, home for. Um, and install these boxes in such a way that they're easy to get to, so you have them about three or four metres off the ground, but still high enough so they're safe for wildlife to be able to use. And as you can see in this photo here, um, and with corporate volunteers, we installed many boxes as well. But most, mostly with the school kids, the A high school kids, 
and the scout groups, and that was an important part of their their schooling and their awards too. With the scouts, they have a lot of awards that they they do community work for. So so they got something out of it in that way, and of course the wildlife and the landowners got a lot out of it too. Um, and once the boxes are installed, that's one thing, but they also need to be monitored and maintained in some cases. So we purchased a nesting box inspection camera, which you can see one of these scouts here holding um, on a long pole, and we use that to inspect the box so we don't have to climb up there. We, that the end of that goes into the nesting box with a camera and we can view what is in the box. And then we keep a record of that on that same data sheet that we uh, that we recorded the other information about this nesting box. So it's another good project for the school kids and the scouts to be involved with um, doing the monitoring. And the maintenance is also an issue. Sometimes we might notice that our box might need, uh, perhaps sometimes in some cases, a new litter that has been shooed off by cockatoos or, or parrots, um, or that maybe they've had uh, been used by feral bees. So in that case, we'll get a beekeeper, a local beekeeper, to come out and remove the hive. Um, and when we are doing the monitoring, we were finding that the boxes were being used by all sorts of different wildlife. As you can see in this photo here, families of sugar gliders, owl at night jars, the rare brush-tailed fasca gale down the bottom right corner there, and, um, and commoner animals too, like the ring-tailed possum. But still important that these animals have somewhere to live too, even the common species. We, we should be privileged that we've got animals that are common, uh, that they're not all threatened. And, and ring-tailed possums are a beautiful little animal to have around. So, so we made boxes for all different creatures, and seeing them using the boxes was very rewarding not only for the school kids and the scouts and the volunteers who installed the boxes, but for the landowners in many cases too. It gave them a lift and, and you know, they saw the wildlife was coming back and, you know, it gave, just gave them that extra encouragement um, that, that things were coming back to normal. And another way we were able to see how the wildlife was recovering was through remote sensor cameras. So we, we purchased quite a few and I would go out to a property and install them just to get an idea mainly of the nocturnal creatures, uh, ground dwelling nocturnal creatures that were coming back on their properties. And as you can see here, we've got a long nosed bandicoot, which was a which was a, a, a very good thing to see. And in some parts of our catchment, we had a really good um, population rebound of long-nosed bandicoots, and, which was great to see. Wombats and swamp wallabies, of course, common creatures, but still you want animals to stay common. And it was great to see even the, the, those sort of animals coming back. And lyrebirds, of course, beautiful birds that were vulnerable to foxes and the long-nosed bandicoot as well too. So the cameras also provided us a way of seeing what pest animals were, were coming back. Um, you know, in some cases, just rabbit or deer and those sort of things, but pest predators like feral cats and foxes. And then landowners had an idea that, of the pest animal problem that they had, and then they could do something about that as far as trapping, baiting, or, or what was, whatever was needed. And we had many rare and interesting animals recorded by our cameras, like the long-nosed bandicoots that I mentioned, but also brush-tailed fascigale. And this one you can see in this photograph here was using that nesting box and um, we were able to get a photo of it on the camera. Now, we had some very good outcomes from our fire recovery program, long-term outcomes that have stayed with us to this day with the Upper Goulburn. And a big part of that was the partnerships that we developed. Like I already mentioned, 
the corporate volunteers that come up every year to do tree planting with us. Um, we also have other school groups, scouts and community groups like the Victorian Mobile Land Care Group and, um, and some of the full drivers too that still come back occasionally and help with other ongoing land care programs in, in whatever way that, you know, is able, they're able to. And the mental health recovery for, for landowners was also, I think, helped by the program that we ran. When landowners got to see the wildlife coming back or teams of volunteers turning up to their property to help them, they come all that way to help them, um, was really uplifting for the landowners and, yeah, lifted their spirits and also helped them with their own mental recovery, personal personal recovery. Um, so I think that was very important. And that's about it from me for now. So I'll hand back to Rowan and if anyone has any questions, we'll be answering those shortly as well. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. I think you know, your learnings from 10 years and the fact that new groups came on board and those projects are ongoing is a, is a real message of hope for some people staring down the barrel of how do I start this recovery. And so, yeah, if anyone's got any questions for Chris, just uh, make sure that you're logged into Landcarer and that your screen's not on full screen and then we'll respond to those questions. After I just give a quick overview of some of the activity Landcare Australia's done this year since, since the bushfires. I was just going to mention one thing, Rowan, before, which I forgot to mention. Um, on the long-term outcomes, we're also uh, in the Upper Goulburn, out of the, the fire recovery program, formed two new land care groups, um, one in the Flowerdale area and one in the, um, the Taggarty Buxton area as well too, the Cathedral Land Care Group and the Flowerdale Land Care Group. And also with many new members to some of the fire affected land care groups, as landowners were assisted by land care and they got an understanding of what land care was all about, it gave them enthusiasm to be involved as members and to form their own groups in those areas that didn't have a group at the time. So just so I just mentioned that. And now I'll just continue. Thanks, Chris. So what we've got up here is a, a map of the extent of the bush fires over the last season. So you can see a map of Australia there. And then all the red areas are those bush fires over the last year. One thing to note is that there's a lot of red, obviously, up on Cape York and throughout Kimberley and the top end. But a lot of that's um, regular seasonal fire. And when we're really talking about the, the black summer bush fires, that's that East Coast fires, Kangaroo Island and Cuddly Creek in South Australia. And the significant and forgotten fires are the great western woodlands in Western Australia where there's been a huge impact to, to land over there that didn't get quite the attention of the East Coast and South Australia. So first, go back, sorry, Chris. <laughs> first off, um, what Landcare Australia did was to collect some of the key resources, particularly those um, developed through the learning and understanding of um, Black Saturday bushfires and, um, and a number of subsequent fires in Victoria. Where unfortunately, we've had some um, fairly large scale runs in and around uh, Melbourne. And there were some really high quality materials published off the back of that, either through Landcare Victoria or through the Arthur Ryler Institute, which is the research arm of the Environment Department here in Victoria, including triage for weeds. I suppose Chris touched on the fact that a whole lot of new and emerging weeds were coming up that people hadn't seen before. They were just sitting in the landscape waiting for the opportunity. So giving landholders some good information about what to expect or what to look for, right from the, the tiny two-leaf stage when it's in a paddock up to um, how to treat it and when to treat it and how to triage that, so to pick the priority species to treat when you've got a whole lot that need treatment, you've got to pick the ones that are going to be the biggest problem first. Also, some support on methods and ideas for erosion control. Um, it's the big risk. Uh, even now we're seeing some areas that haven't had that significant rainfall. So giving groups the opportunity to access that material 
and find out um, different methods for erosion control to help maintain water quality throughout their systems after the fact of bushfires. We also have a big long contact list for other people to go to support, such as um, conservation volunteers or Australian Association of Bushland Regenerators or other funding sources too, because land care is by no means the main funding source for groups. Um, so we're all in this together. And so we see our role as a strong networking role and putting people and projects and funding together to support the land care movement more broadly. So beyond resources, we also uh, attended a whole lot of different recovery roundtables, both nationally and also ongoing in Victoria, where um, we're trying to work with a lot of other conservation and, and government organisations to streamline the response and make sure that we can get the, the best um, recovery effort that we can. And we also have worked very hard with our corporate partners, philanthropic supporters and donors to set up some funding rounds, including some short and medium term grants. And we had the early days of a corporate volunteering program for bushfire affected um, areas. However, COVID-19 has put a stop on that, but we see that, fingers crossed, hopefully getting going later this year or sometime early next year as um, conditions allow. What you can see now is that same map of the extent of the bushfires together with uh, a copy of the National Land Care Directory, which is our database of all the land care groups and networks and even individuals that have um, been involved in our projects in the past. And so we could generate a contact list of people to find out who had been affected and how we might be able to help. And as you can see there, we found over 600 land tech care groups impacted by the bushfires over um, last summer. And so what happened was the Land Care Australia grants team all got together and hit the phones and the Land Care Services team and started calling groups and networks in uh, February this year to try and undertake a rapid needs assessment. So finding out what those main priorities were for those groups and sort of an indicative timeline and cost for those activities. What that then allowed us to do was to step back and try and um, paint a picture of that need for land care across the board. And so right from Victoria through to Queensland, WA, South Australia, so that we could then go out to government and demonstrate that need and what that cost might look like and what the timelines would be and what those key project activities were. We were able to align those activities with state and federal government priorities as well and show where the overlap was and um, generate some more support for land care activities. So that initial um, call around identified eight and a half million dollars of project funding for one to three year projects. <clears throat> and with the triage approach we had to those timelines, we tried to pick out the most urgent ones from that. So the, the one year to sort of 18 months and we've come up with a list of 200 projects just from that call around with a call of over $4 million worth of ask for groups and different projects seeking funding. Well above and beyond that was the clear need from groups and networks for bushfire recovery coordinators. There's, a, you know, there's hundreds of coordinators out there, just like Chris, who are working tirelessly already only to have bushfire and now COVID on top of it. And they're doing an incredible job and Funding to support those is really well needed and looking for ways that we can get more coordinators out on the ground and help support them, be it through existing grant rounds or new opportunities as arise is certainly something we're very conscious of and advocating for. Um, here's a map of the projects we've uh, provided so far through our um, relationships with other not-for-profits and researchers, um, philanthropic groups and cross-sectoral corporate partners. We've already put in two major transparent open grants rounds and a number of smaller grants as well. In 2020 so far for bushfire recovery, we've put out $1.6 million in non-government funding to community bushfire recovery projects, which is 84 different local land care projects underway. And they're those green dots you can see on the maps. You notice a couple of outliers and that would be, uh, so Tasmania, there's a project there, which was a bushfire from the previous year, but it's very wildlife specific and that was of an appeal to WISE in particular that had a wildlife focus for their grants round. And there's also one there up in the northwest in Broome where there was a really strong community bushfire impact project. So just because their bushfires are red and are seasonal, they're not always good fires and that Broome project was an example of one that's had a big impact on the community. 
So just as a, a bit of a role of what Landcare Australia can do is by having a broad national reach, it allows us to really paint a picture of all the different activities that are out there and try to bring them together and make some sense of the, the impact that Landcare has as a whole. And so the, the wires infographic, you can see there's a really good example of how together we can achieve an incredible amount. And this is just one grants round, you know, representing all of the activity that's going on out there. So from this one alone, 92,000 trees are going to be planted. Um, 50 wildlife species are being targeted across 24 different um, catchment regions. A whole bunch of different threatened species are being supported. But not only that, but we're able to communicate what these projects are to the wider Australia so that people get a better idea about what land care is and what we do, and hopefully attract more volunteers and more um, support for what we do so that we can keep doing the great work we do. You know, some of the activities that are out there are building community capacity and resilience through bringing people together, telling stories, coordinating volunteers, which is very much the work that Chris and um, coordinators and facilitators like him do and helping create partnerships for that on-ground action. Groups get out there and they remove burnt and fallen trees from fence lines, roads and access tracks. They restore habitat for wildlife through revegetating bush areas, installing nest boxes, planting paddock trees and shelter belts, which have benefits not only for wildlife, but for stock as well. It's really important. As Chris touched on, controlling weeds is a huge part of post-fire recovery, and it's not just the first six months. It's one, three, five, ten years worth of work before as far as weeds go, it's ongoing, but these early stages are one of those most important stages to get on top of them before that first seed set comes. Installing fencing is certainly something we know there is a um, overwhelming need from groups and individuals out there and it requires an enormous amount of funding. And so while we're not funded to do that, we certainly are able to help link up groups with, with federal funding opportunities or state-based funding opportunities or um, things which come up through catchment regions or um, groups like Blaze Aid and CVA that are out there and, and working on conservation fencing, for example, as well as opportunities through our own grants. So it's a together we're stronger approach towards all of these activities, but fencing in particular we know is a hot topic and we always try and include it in funding opportunities. Managing erosion I've touched on already is particularly important while that ground cover um, comes back after being burnt, but also workshops and training too. Chris touched on the formal and informal training pathways that, that land care groups all over the country are doing to help improve um, land management practices. So what's next? Um, some exciting news we had recently was our partnership with Ausfish and Native Fish Australia, which was a federal Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment Wildlife and Habitat Bushfire Recovery Program funded grant, where we're working at 18 different sites from Queensland down to Victoria, working on riparian restoration and water quality improvement for a whole suite of threatened fish, but also obviously um, crayfish and turtles and any other species that's in the water too. So that's a great partnership and it includes a reintroduction of Macquarie perch in Victoria too. So that's a really, really exciting project that we're looking forward to kicking off quite soon. As I said, Landcare Australia is part of a number of different roundtables for bushfire recovery and advocating for the needs of landcare groups who we're talking to every day about their needs and their projects and what we can and can't help with and, and making sure that we can best represent their views nationally. Uh, we're also connecting with other environmental groups, as I said, like CVA and um, ARBA and uh, the state and territory organisations too. We're working together to identify projects and priorities together so that, that um, we can have a coordinated national program towards recovery. So to that, uh, Landcare Australia do have an online expression of interest form, which lets you put in some ideas around your project. If you go to the Landcare Australia website opportunities page, you can log in there um, and put in some details and they can be quite high level, just something you think you need or you'd like to, if you've got some good detail, those sorts of project examples really help us go out and advocate for you and your patch and what you want to do too. So if we get a call from someone who's interested in working somewhere and we've got something on the books, that makes it very easy for us to turn around and go back to the funder, whoever they are, and say, here's what we've already got, here's how we can work together and deliver something. So there's already been quite a few examples of that working this year where we've had something through that call around back in February right through to expressions of interest throughout the year. But also the grants team and the inquiries um, team at Landcare Australia are always there to listen to your calls and 
help work through project ideas or problems and put you in touch with people who might be able to help you. So know that you can always get in touch with us and, and we're here to help. So yeah, Landcare Australia, working with our corporate partners, um, as well as the National Landcare Network and the state and territory organisations, will keep working to support the landcare community to restore land, water and our coastal landscapes, enhancing habitats and strengthening communities as we go. Um, hopefully there's been some questions coming in while I was um, talking. And so I'll just um, pass them on to Chris in a moment. But just a reminder that if you did have some questions for me or for Chris, if you just make sure that your screen's not minimised and that you're logged into Landcarer and um, we'll try and answer them for you. Uh, just to get the ball rolling, we've got a, a question, uh, Chris, from Florence, who wants to know about the nest box program you got and how many boxes were used for nesting and what sort of species were using them. Well, the program still continues as well, our nesting box project, so it's probably up into the high hundreds at this stage, but through the bushfire recovery program, we, we installed almost 500 nesting boxes for all different types of animals, um, bigger possums, brush tail and ring tail possums, and in some cases for birds like uh, ducks and kookaburras. But Probably the most common box that we put up, the most popular, was for the small creatures like sugar gliders and brush-tailed fescagales. Um, so we installed many of those boxes and they were very well used. In some cases you could tell if there was enough natural hollows out there because they wouldn't be used as, as often as some other areas. Farming areas particularly had more of an uptake um, of this box use. Uh, because, you know, lacking the, the natural hollows and, and a lot of their revegetation areas that we were putting the boxes in were only young trees, so they hadn't got to that stage where they could start developing natural hollows. But, of course, these revegetation re areas in some cases were very well established, so the food was there and the connectivity was there between other areas, um, but the, the old trees that had hollows in them were in sort of short supply. So. Um, so yeah, but, but yeah, probably sugar gliders were the most common animal that we'd find uh, using the boxes, and it was always great to see you know a family like in the photo I put up earlier, um, you know sometimes two or three or so, as much as eight or nine I've had in some boxes. So it's very worthwhile putting them up. But it's important if you put up a nesting box that you put it up on its side of the tree where it's protected. Um, say the south or the southeast side, protected from the hot northerly sort of weather um, because that's going to be the killer for animals that are in the box during the summertime. But th there is some information about nesting boxes that we can put up a link to um, to some different websites and things where you can get more information on, on building, installing and monitoring and maintaining nesting boxes. Actually, to that, can I encourage everybody? It's something I've only come across recently. Is a website, and I'm there on Facebook as well, called Nest Box Tales. Nest Box Tales, and they've got a tremendously long list of um, different designs for nest boxes and sort of how to maintain and install them. So yes. I'll um, share that link after this as well. Yep. Also, got a question here from um, Jill Williams, who was interested in what you did with all the old fencing and. Um, it's actually two parts. One is the fencing, and a second one is uh, what was your survival rate for the revegetation planting? Um, well, with the fencing materials, the, the metal parts of it, like the old steel pickets and wires that we rolled up, uh, that was that all went to um, recycling. Um, in some cases, early on, we were taking it in the trailer to the local tip, which um, then got that collected and, and um, for scrap metal. Um, and then, other, and then as the project went on, we are able to get um, stockpiles of it collected from farms as well by, by some of the, um, the metal um, salvage to the mobs that are out there. So, yeah, we try to recycle as much of that. Oh, there's a corgi. Um, get as much of that recycled as possible. And the other, the other question was about the survival rate of plants. Is that right, Ralph? Um, yes, well, because we had 
strict sort of restrictions with the sites we were going to plant on um, as far as that they were protected from stock um, and also from any sort of woody weeds mainly that would sort of smother them and, and affect the growth of the plants such as blackberry and things. So the sites were usually well sort of main, uh, well set up sites and that wasn't so much of an issue. Um, you did sometimes get browsing by deer, which and even sometimes native animals too, wallabies um, in particular. But deer were probably the biggest sort of problem and still are and becoming more of a problem. Um, so, but I'd say probably two thirds to three quarters on average would be the um, the average survival rate in our reed areas. Some better, some a bit worse. You know, depending on what best animals were there or depending on the weather for that particular year. Um, I had a question here from Audra, who's uh, interested in revegetation of native pastures. I know that's grown significantly in interest from the community in the past 10 years, but was that an element of, of pasture recovery that you were part of? No, not really. Um, we did use native grasses in many of our reveg projects. Tussock grasses mainly, Themida, Poa, those sort of things. Um, but not in the pasture situation. It was more for, yeah, like revegetating um, along a waterway that might have needed rushes and, and sedges and, and tussock sort of uh, vegetation. Um, so, yeah, although in, in some of the garden areas too, you know, like because ornamental, a lot of native grasses, indigenous grass, grasses are quite ornamental for for a bush a bush block garden. So, but not so much the pasture situation. No, that wasn't an issue that we sort of got into. Certainly, from my perspective, I see it as a real opportunity for for some farmers to to reset how their approach to their farms, be that internal fencing or what sort of pasture that's going in. So. Be really good to hear from people if they do have stories about bushfire recovery and, and replacing pastures with native perennials, for example. We'd love to yeah. hear that on land care or through the bushfire community page. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Um, uh, one question, I suppose, what, what would be your top advice? I know that something I think about and worry about with coordinators is burnout in the recovery and taking on too much. And that's not just land care, that's, that's the bushfire recovery in general. Have you got any? Top tips for groups for how to manage that, both for coordinators but also for volunteers in recovery? Yeah, well, we were fortunate. Like I said earlier, um, some of the neighbouring land care networks, especially to the north of us, the Strathbogie Ranges and up in the Highlands, their coordinators came down and had a, were a big assistance with us, um, not just out in the field but also helping us with... Um, you know, applying for funding and that sort of thing too. So, um, you know, administration stuff even. So that was, that was you know, really appreciated, that help from other land care coordinators and land care people. Uh, but there were so many offers of assistance, volunteer assistance. So getting the work done was, was you know, um, there was plenty of opportunities for that, getting the actual on-ground work done. But I suppose it's just a matter of really delegating and not being sort of wanting to take on everything yourself when you've got well, – I had a very good well, – we do have a very good executive committee at the Upper Goulburn, very supportive, and um, they were a great help to me and the other land care coordinator, Bridget, who was involved in the early days. Um, so having a good network, executive committee, and taking up those offers of assistance um, from from people is important. And just realise and understanding what's achievable too. Um, and you know, trying to to manage your workload so that you know you don't just have lots of half started jobs, but you're actually completing jobs and. Yeah, yeah, managing your workload and just getting that support from people around you that are there that are not offering to help. Thanks, Chris. We're getting we're getting the wrap up. It's that's uh, time there, but I just thought I'd like to finish on a note from 
Roger Cook from the King Lake Landcare Group, who commented uh, that he'd like to testify to the immense value of fire recovery after Black Saturday and Chris Coburn and the Upper Goulburn Landcare Group's important role in that process. So good uh, shout out to you, Chris, for all of your great work and thank you again for your presentation today. Yeah, uh, that's all right. Well, I think we're, as I said, we're always happy to be answering questions too. Yeah, uh, thanks, Cookie, for that those kind words. Uh, I know Roger, of course, King Lake Landcare President, um, and fires, burnt out in the fires too. So I um, always oh, told everyone that thousands of times. Um, but, yeah, so if anyone has any other questions, uh, I can be contacted. Rowan, you've got details for how people can contact me with any other questions. And this webinar has also been recorded, so we'll make that available to anyone to review later down the track or to share with anyone else who might be interested. And just before we wrap up, and I can encourage anyone who's interested to join the Bushfire Recovery Community on Landcare. So you'll find that on the Communities drop-down link there on the webpage, or just go to www.landcarer.com.au slash bushfire recovery. And we'll be posting regular updates about opportunities and different support that will be available too. And we're keen to hear about how people's bushfire recovery is going. So thank you everyone for coming today and thanks again, Chris, for your presentation. No worries. Thank you, everyone.